good. Um, Welcome. Um, okay. So, so we're, we've, uh, in the last session, we talked about some of the basics, just touching on the basics of stock and flow diagrams. Um, suffice it to say, there's, there's a bunch of additional guidelines for, for building up structure out of many stocks, and not just one stock, but when you link stocks together, you can build up structures, aging, structures representing aging, a progression of illness, the natural history of infection. You can have competing risks issues, like Simon was asking about, where we have some people who recover, but some people who die before recovery. So we can build up models out of these pieces. And one of the types of models that are very popular for looking at are infectious disease models in these areas. Um, and um, just to give a, uh, a, a quick sort of glimpse of these models, I'd like us to open up the model called Simple Incidence Recovery Stock and Flow with Upstream <laughs> Stock and Infection Dynamics. Um, and, and I believe that should be in your examples area, okay? Um, so here, uh, simple incidence of recovery, stock and flow with upstream stock and infection dynamics. And um, sure, okay. Could we suggest numbering these models or something for the workshop, just so it's easier to Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I'd like that. Um, that's good. Um, so number models. Yeah, that's great. Um, we could have them under a name in the additional models folder, but but here, yeah, we'll we'll keep them numbered. Okay. Okay. So so are there any? Are did anyone have any problems loading that in? Okay. So so this is a model here which is going to include a variety of factors in a very, very simple way related to, to infectious disease transmission. Um, models in this area link, uh, include a variety of, of things. Um, some of them are listed here. A particular common ones are sort of mixing between different members of population transmission of infection, development and loss of immunity, um, sort of multi-stage progression, recovery, um, Variability in contacts is sometimes included, uh, sometimes elements of the immune response, et cetera. Now, infectious disease models have some distinctive characteristics relative to some of the models we've looked at, even, even glimpsed thus far. Um, they are unstable, so they, uh, they can have instabilities, so they can lead to very rapid change, say it's just associated with an outbreak. They're nonlinear. The models we've actually been looking at may exhibit output that certainly nonlinear. We saw that decreasing rates um, for that last slide. But the models themselves were linear. And what that meant is they were amenable to certain types of, of simple reasoning. Um, but these models are actually nonlinear. They can have tipping points. They can have points where the behavior of the model is very, very different for small changes in parameter values, the value of the model is, is qualitatively different. Most classic cases, the infection either dies out or stays in. However, there's, there's other cases as well where you could have, on the one hand, perhaps oscillations. On the other hand, you have just high persistent levels of infection. And on a third component, you would have uh, die out of infection. You can have oscillations. And you can have different, what I call equilibria, different points where the system comes to rest, okay? Um, these are instabilities, uh, you know, sudden outbreaks here, um, oscillations and delays. It turns out oscillations involve negative feedbacks in the models associated with delays. Um, and there's some clear reading reasons associated with this. Um, for example, the stock of susceptibles continues to deplete 
as long as the number of people getting infected is greater than the number of people coming in. And conversely, the number of people, the number of infectious people continues to go down as long as the recoveries from that stock exceed the number of people getting infected. So we'll, we'll see some of these delays. Um, okay, um, and this leads to some important issues including multiple policies having quite different effects uh, in combination. And you know, doubling of investment in a given area does not lead to doubling of results. We saw this in um, some of the models UN uh, and Fatima worked on last term um, together with Assad, where you know, doubling of the, the amount of contact tracing did not lead to a massive increase in the benefits of contact tracing. The first 10% led to disproportionate impact. So in these models, we have multiple points they can get to sometimes uh, associated with what's called path dependence. A model, on the one hand, with one set of parameter values can lead to an outcome that's very different than with a different set of parameter values. And the interventions can shape it in big different ways. We have two equilibria, two possible outcomes that are of particular interest. One which is called the disease-free equilibria, where there's no infectives in the population at all, and the entire population is susceptible versus an equilibrium which is endemic, where we have essentially an equilibrium that's produced by the spread of the illness. And this, this may be static, where we have the amount of infection in the population stay more or less constant, but it's stable. And so any perturbations bring it back to that level. Or it could be dynamic, where we actually have fluctuations. We have, we have oscillations over the years. That would be called a dynamic equilibrium. And it, it you know, keeps on bouncing up and down. And as we saw in this sort of situation, sort of a dynamic equilibrium here in Saskatchewan, right here, um, sort of month by month here. OK, so, and then we have, um, we can have uh, disease, disease for equilibrium as a, as a possible outcome, as we've mentioned. Um, okay, so not wanting to go into this too much. Here's, uh, you know, one star can lead to a huge increase in infection, huge increase in the number of infectives. Uh, this is actually in, uh, I think, thousands. Um, a slight decrease in the initial number of infectives, say, can lead to an almost die out of the infection. Here we have infectives on this axis and susceptibles. You're going to have to eliminate those, I think, from the presentation. Okay, so the classic models in this area that we'll be looking at a variant of is, is a model that divides the population into three classes susceptible, infectious, recoveries. And this is based on work by Hendrick and McCormack in the 1920s, actually, before computer simulations were available. And this provides the model that, that's essentially similar to the one you see before us. Um, it's got a few little differences here, but we can experiment with this, with this model here. So here we have susceptibles, we have infectives, and recoveries. These are stocks, and we have flows between them. The flow here is that simple first order delay type of situation we talked about earlier, where a certain number of people at risk of who have the infection and a certain mean time they have for the disease. And the formula for recovery is just this divided by that. Okay? And that leads to people flying from infected to recover. Um, on the other hand, the infection the transmission of infection going from susceptible to infective is more complex. And in order to describe this, we often give a name S or X for susceptibles, I or Y for infectives, and R for recoveries. And we call N the total size of the population. What would the total size of the population be here? To make sure people are awake. What's the total size of the population? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. Very good. Okay, so we can name these things in this sort of way. And we're going to name this mu, this time to recovery. Beta is going to be the per contact risk of infection. So given that there's exposure, given that there's contact between two individuals, what's the chance of transmission of the infection? 
And then C is the contact per susceptible per unit time. That's important. That should be labeled per unit time. Um, so that might be like 10 contacts per month. Okay. Um, oh. Um, so this is the number of contacts that susceptible will have with anyone. And this beta is the chance if you bring together a susceptible with a recovered person or with an infective, what's the chance the infection will get transmitted given that exposure? So you have two who come into contact. What's the chance you get transmission of the pathogen from one to the other? Okay, so we're going to work through these terms here. So. In order to understand this model, we're going to focus on this little formula here. See where that comes from. Okay. Um, we're going to. We'll go, let's go take a look at it now. Let's go press this guy here, and let's go click on incidents. And what we're going to see here is this: this is the number of susceptibles times the per contact risk of infection times contacts per susceptible times fractional prevalence. Okay, and we're going to explain this. So I'm going to explain this formula in, in just a moment here. This is susceptibles times some risk per unit time. Let's go. Let's go check that out. Okay. So who remembers what I is? I is the number of infectives. I'm impressed. Um, so n is the. What is n? Total population size. So what's I over N? The fraction, yeah, it's the prevalence. It's the fraction of the entire population that's assumed to be infected here and infected, but we're, we're assuming they're the same for simplicity for the moment. We can deal with latent periods by extending these models, but we're assuming they're the same here. Okay. So this is a fraction of the population that's infected. What's C times that? Well, C is the number of contacts the susceptible has with anyone per unit time, say per, say per month. How many contacts do they have per month? Now, if this was a needle, if this was a bloodborne disease, these could be needle sharing contacts. If this is a sexually transmitted infection, it could be sexual contacts, um, or it could be sexual partnerships, uh, different partnerships. If this is a airborne disease, it would be uh, some sort of other sorts of contacts that could be more distant. So C is the number of contacts they have with anyone per month. What's C times I over N? This is the number of contacts they have with anyone per unit time. C times I over N. I over N, we're going to assume here, for the sake of the simple model, that for the people around them, the fraction of those people around them with whom they come into contact that are infected is similar to the fraction of the entire population that's infected. This is the fraction of the entire population that's infected, right? It's I over N, yeah? So C times I over N gives us the number of infectives with whom they come into contact per, per month. C is the total number of people. I come into contact with 100 people per month if 50% of the whole population is infected, then I come into contact per month with an average of 50 people, 50 infected people per month. Okay? Does that make sense? Total number of people, total number of people I come into contact with, and this is the number of fraction of infected in the whole population, and by extension, I'm assuming to the people around me, it's a similar fraction. So C times I over N is the number of people I come into contact with per month. Okay, now, the assumption here that's often made, and it's a very good approximation for a small beta, that if beta is small, if I have a chance, beta, for each contact a susceptible has, so this susceptible is having C contacts with anyone, C times I over N with infectives, for each of those contacts with infectives, let's go, that many contacts with infectives, they have this chance, beta, of transmission. Beta is small, particularly with the, the um, chance of transmission for many of those contacts of getting the infection is approximately C times I over N times beta. Now, we can actually write out a formula for the exact probability. You can, you can actually very easily put it into the model. But for the moment, this is the approximation that's, that's frequently used. And this is 
It's called the force of infection. The likelihood a given susceptible will be infected per unit time. Okay, these contacts with anyone, this many with the infectives per month, so this many contacts per month total, oh, oh, um, this many with, with infectives per month total, that's the probability per month that they get infected. And this is called the force of infection. Um, so this expresses their chance, their sort of risk at which they're under of getting infected per month. It's per month or per unit time, okay? So, if we have that chance, if each susceptible has that chance of getting infected per month, how many susceptibles get infected per month? If there's S susceptibles, how many people on average have been infected per month? The number of infectives multiplied by the number of susceptibles that were in contact with the human right? Okay, so it's certainly going to depend on the number of infectives, but I think we can actually, so it will depend on that, but it's also going to depend on the number of susceptibles, as you said. So if I have each susceptible has a certain risk of being infected per month of such and such, and I have S susceptibles, how many people get infected per month on average? S sorry? S by multiplied by the force of infection. So if I have a 10% chance getting infected and there's a hundred people at risk or are susceptible each of them has a 10% chance of getting infected on average of 10 people will get infected per month right okay okay so that's where the formula comes from um and we can reason about it additional ways here but um that's where this formula comes from. Per contact risk of infection, that's the beta here. I should probably rearrange this. Um, uh, in model. Um, so that's, that's this beta. So this susceptible, that's this S here. And then contacts per susceptible is the C. And then fractional prevalence is what? I over N. So that's where that comes from. The number of people going down here per month, right? Okay. Okay, so this is, this is good. Okay, so this is our model structure here. You'll recognize it right there. And we have some feedbacks. Okay, so let's do some experiments. I'd like you to set C to be 10. It may already be this. So let's just double check what, what things are. 10, contacts per susceptible. Beta, that's our per contact risk of infection. By the way, that should be, this. I stand remiss. I sit remiss before you. Um, contacts per susceptible per month. This should be per month, right? Is the time unit month? Let's go verify this. Setting, model settings, month. Okay, good. So, context per susceptible per month, okay? Okay, so that's C, that should be 10. Beta should be 0.04, let's go click on that. So this is the equation thing, 0.04, yeah? Okay, good. Um, mu, this is the average duration of infectiousness. Oh, let's change it to 10, okay? Um, birth and death rate, zero. Um, no migration, right, you're in? Um, so, initial infectives equals one. So I want one initial infective and a thousand initial susceptibles, okay? And no initial recoveries, right? Remember what you need to run them all? You need... I gotta specify the initial values to start. Why don't I have to specify the values after that? Why do I only have to specify the initial values to start? Sorry? Oh, yeah, no, but uh, 
so, so where did the value, what are the values of the stocks, the initial values I give to it, where do they come from after that? They come from the, okay, it's from the flows. Yeah, good, good. I just, I want to make sure people are, you know, the, the neurons are still firing. Um, uh, okay, so even if my esophageal cells are, are fading. Um, okay, so let's run this thing. Um, so I just pressed run. Eh? Okay, here, let's, let's do baseline SIR. Baseline SIR. Okay, so what do you see before you when you run that? Do you see something like this on the screen? Yeah? Okay. Um, okay, so what do we see in terms of the prevalence, that the number of the prevalent cases of illness? What, what would you describe the outcome of the simulation being? By the way, we could double click on this and then we can click on this guy over here, graph. Oh, we can see it closer up. So what would you say happened? Can anyone describe qualitatively what happened? Right, so it, it, it decreased then, right? What does the number of susceptibles do? Okay, so, so how many people started susceptible? Okay, and so then what happens? What, why is it going down so steep here? Can anyone tell me? Why is the number of susceptibles going down so quickly? at this time. Where are they going? <laughs> They're getting infected. Yeah, okay. Does it, does it go to zero? No. no, it actually stays at a low level. So, so it's kind of like if you ever start a fire in the fireplace, it burns through and after it goes out, there's still a bit of wood sometimes. Little bits of wood that are unburnt. Those are the unburnt susceptibles. This fire flared up it consumed its, went up to a high level, but it was consuming its fuel, got less and less fuel to go on, and it declined. Okay, um, what do you think the recovered has done? Ah. By the way, how do we know it, it's got to increase? There's no outflow, there's no one dying. The population size is constant, right? If I went and I looked at this, the population size, what do you think it is? It's 1,001. Um, number recovered, so this is just gonna go up, right? Why isn't it reaching all, everyone? Yeah, you still have some susceptibles, that's right. Basically, you have no infectives. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, let's do one other experiment. So that was the baseline. Now let's do a experiment where we have, let me do a quick calculation in the head. Um, okay, let, let's, let's, let's do an experiment where we have uh, mu equals two. Yeah, mu equals two. So the average duration of infectiousness is very quick. Maybe we're catching people more quickly maybe through contact tracing, some other mechanism, treating them effectively so they don't spread illness, like with antibiotics, right? So, so we're gonna change average duration of infectiousness to two, and then I'm gonna do um, SIR, uh, you know, infection, infection, this is just the name of this run, right? Infection duration equals two, right? I'm gonna run it. I just ran it. Okay, so so what happened? What happened? So so what do you see here? So it says blue is SAR infection duration. Where is it? Can anyone see it?
Where is it here? Ah, the fox has shown its tail. Um, so, so let's go. Here's absolute prevalence. Oh my gosh, it's, it's died there. Let's, let's go look at a table. Remember, we can display graphs, but we can also display tables. In fact, we can, Benson allows you to export things and import data if you want. But, but here's absolute prevalence. Why did it start at one? Why did it, why did it start at one person? Infected. Yeah, in fact, remember we told it, start with one person here. Remember that? Now, now here we go and we look. What's going on? That baseline, that baseline, the, the first one we ran, here the infection starts taking off. See it's going up? You can think of these as kind of the average number of people who are infected. And if you want to think of the decimals that way, look at that, it's really taking off. See that? It's really rising quickly, eh? See that? Really rising quickly. How about this other one? How about the latest one we ran? What's it doing? Well, on average, fewer and fewer people are infected. By, by the time you're way out here, very, very few people. It died out. That infection died out of the population. Why? Well, we'll see. By the way, I'll show you a trick here, which is useful to know. So in this little thing, watch this. Do export window contact. See this little, this little thing here? Yeah? Watch this. Um, so here's Excel. Paste. There you go. I can create those in Excel. Want to compare those same two? Watch this. Boom. Hey. Hey, don't give me that. Um, okay, here you go. Uh, boom. Yeah, there they are in Excel, right? So, a very nice little quick interface to Excel. These are the names of the, of the things. Okay. Um, anyway, back to ball game. Um, okay, so, so we just ran these things with different assumptions. One time it died out. One time it took off. I mean, let's do a bit more experimentation. Um, suppose the average duration of infectiousness was, was, were five, okay? What's gonna happen now? So it's not quite as quick. Average duration five, let's run it with five. Run. Oh, look at, look at that. Can anyone describe to you what happened now? What stands before you? So this was, the, this was the baseline we originally ran, and the most recent one was the five, which is the blue. So what happened there? So was there an outbreak that took off? So here we go, here's the prevalence. Was there a bit of an outbreak? So it, it came up to some level, and it declined. The original one came way up here. This one, it came up and it declined, but it, it sort of played out over a, um, and, it, and so it's small, and it, and it declined. How many people got, got uh, infected? Well, we could look at how many people susceptible remain. That one, in fact, the first one infected the very first one we did, in fact, a large, large fraction of the population. This one, in fact, a much smaller segment. See that? Much smaller. There's, there's actually about, what, 200 people remaining? I mean, we could go click on this, and we can, we can go, um, go over here. Sorry, I just needed to adjust the screen width. Um, over here, and there we go. There's about 200 people remaining at the end um, in that stock. So, 200 people did not get infected, or 800 got infected. The attack rate was about 80%. Um, okay, um, so we saw, you know, a tipping point there, right? We saw one, we pushed that average duration of infections as low enough, the infection will die out entirely. If we don't push it low enough, we'll lower the infection, but it won't die out altogether, okay? Okay, so what's going on here? Okay, um, okay, so let's think this thing through. I'll, and I'll, I'll, um, 
Maybe, well, yeah, I think we'll have to refer to this. So this is the sort of flavor that we saw. Again, it'll differ a little bit in the, per, in the particular numeric values. And this is the flavor. This is the number of infectives. This is the number of susceptibles. And this is the number of recoveries. Okay? Why do we see this pattern? What's going on here? Does anyone notice this looks a little bit exponential early on? It gets faster and faster and faster. This on the other hand, what does this remind you of? What does that remind you of? Mind you, it should remind you a little bit of this. Sort of goal seeking. It's, it's approaching some, some equilibrium, or this one here. We have elements of all of that. Let's, let's talk about why. Okay, look. So, in the short term, each infective is surrounded by what? Each effect that comes into contact with C people per unit ton, with a certain number of people per month. How many of those people? So what's, the, in, in the very beginning, what's really interesting about those people? All those people are, are susceptible. They're surrounded by susceptible people. So they can be very efficient at affecting people. Think about it. Um, each infective can infect this many people here. I mean, it's a simple rearrangement of the terms there. And, and here, everyone's susceptible. So S over N is essentially 1. So this is just C times beta people per, per time unit. So here, we had C equals whatever it was, 10 and this guy is 0.04, so they're infecting four people per time unit, each infective. The rate of recovery is basically zero, because no one has been infected. So in the short term, the number of infectives grows quickly. The rate of infection rises very, very quickly. We have a positive feedback. Why a positive feedback? Help me understand, why is there a positive feedback? Let me see if I have a little, ah, ah, okay. I think I have a little diagram, oh yes, here. So what's, oh gosh, this is new infections, this is infect, infectives, and this is contact between susceptibles and infectives. This is operating early on, right? The more, con the more new infectives there are, the more infectives there are, the more contacts there are between a sus any susceptible and an infective, and the more it spreads. It's like the sp spread of zombies. Um, <laughs> So, so if I infect UD, now there's two of us spreading in this room. And now we can spread it to even more quickly. And then I, in, I infect Assad, and he starts spreading it. Right? And he infects Simon. Now all the men are infected. Um, and uh, and we, we're, we're just spreading it very quickly. Okay. Um, so early on, the number of infectives grows quickly. We have that feedback loop, that central feedback loop operating. It's dominant. It's spreading out this way right here. More and more. But what's happening? What limits that? Tell me what limits that. Well, we're starting to have fewer and fewer susceptibles. And put it another way, each infective is surrounded by limited number of individuals. a limited number of, in, of susceptible, susceptible individuals. They're in fact surrounded more and more by people who are already in, been infected. Maybe they're currently infective, maybe they're curr they were recovered, but they're not susceptible. So, so at first, the number of susceptibles is still high enough that overwhelmingly each infective is surrounded by susceptibles. Maybe there's one or two people around them that they can't infect, but everyone else they can infect. So they're very efficient. Each infective is very efficient. One sneeze goes a long way. But, but here, when the number of susceptibles starts to decline, there's fewer and fewer of them. So each infective, in a way, has to work harder and harder to spread that illness. There's fewer and fewer, right? But moreover, now this gets into the stocks and flows of it, okay? So we have more and more infectives coming up here, right? And what's going on? I mean, if we look at this model, more and more people are coming this way. Very few people are going this way initially because they're not yet recovered. 
but eventually, more and more people are coming this way, but quite a few people are recovering, too, because there's quite a few infectives. And so you're starting to get some recoveries going on, and you're starting to get slower, because each infective is less efficient. They're surrounded by more and more non-susceptibles. Um, so you get, you know, slowing of the rise of the number of infectives. More people are recovering, that's an outflow, and there's less inflow, less quick inflow. Um, but it's still going to be increased. When is it going to be, when is it going to be flat here? At what point does a stock become flat? Outflow. Good. And what does it mean that the inflow equals the outflow for I? It means the number of people, the rate at which they're recovering is the same as the rate at which they're coming in due to catching the infection, right? Okay, um, so at that point, we have, a, we have a maximum number of infectives. It's reached its maximum. Inflow equals outflow. But the seeds of their destruction are already sown, right? Because they're not very efficient, even at this point, in infecting people. Put another way, and I, I would, had I time, I would show you how this is. It, it wouldn't require a long time, but not enough today. But each of those, another way to put it is, at, a, at an individual level, each of those infectives will infect how many people before they recover? They've got to infect, if it's not going up and it's not going down over the course of an illness, how many people must they have infected before they recover? It's not going, going to go up after they, you know, recover. It's not going to go down. What, what must it be? Infected one person before they recover. Over the entire course of illness, they've infected one person before they recover. Why would it be so low? Because they're surrounded by people who have already been infected. They're either recovered or infected. So they're not very efficient, yeah? So at this point, they're very inefficient at, at transmitting. They're only affecting one person over the course of their illness. Why is it going to go down now? Why is it going to go down? Okay. Okay, yes. So look, this is the susceptible of stock. And this is the, the susceptible stock, the blue, right? This guy right here. So less infection, more recovery. Is that right? Yeah, so okay, first of all, there's lots. They're at their peak here in infectives. This guy, infectives, are at their peak. And that's going to start declining because all these infectives have got to recover. And so we start having, coming out here, start having a lot of people coming out. And so that's going to draw down this stock. But the other thing is, they're going to become, just as Irene said, they're going to become even less efficient at, at spreading because the number of susceptibles is just going down at this point. It's still declining. Right? People are still getting sick, so people are still coming out of here, and as long as the number of people getting sick is exceeding the, the immigration coming in, or immigration plus birth, this is going to be declining. And because that's declining, each infective is going to have even fewer than, than one person they infect over the course of their illness. They're going to have a really hard time infecting someone. And lots of them are going to be recovering. So this is going to come down. Now, why is this coming down so quickly, though? Because the fewer the infectives are, the what? What is that? It's going to, what's the implication for this? Less new cases. Less new cases. So the rate of this is going to decline very, very quickly. Now, mind you, this is also going to be declined, but this is going to decline very, very quickly. And so... As the number of infectives starts to come down, you get this sort of accelerating effect where there's even fewer, more imbalance, even more, the number of people recovering still greatly exceeds the number of people coming in. So that's pulling that down. And the number of susceptibles is still declining. It's still going down because people are still getting infected. Um, and, and so the number of susceptibles, so it's like, this is the peak of the fire. There was lots of wood early on to keep the fire going. Lots of wood to spread it. The fire was growing and growing. But at some point, the amount of unburnt wood becomes small. The, the fire isn't growing anymore. And in fact, by that point, 
The fire is starting to use up its wood. With all this fire around, and it's consuming wood very, very quickly, but there's not a lot still to go on, and so it's, it's, it's not able to keep its level, and it starts to decline. And the amount of wood is still going down here. So the amount of fire is going to go down and down and down. And why is it decreasing even now? Why is this number of, of, of infected still going down even sort of later here? Why doesn't it start to go up again? Why is it still going down? Well, there are people coming in here, but they're fewer and fewer because the number of susceptibles is, is, is still declining somewhat. And moreover, this, this, the number of people going out here still exceeds this. It still exceeds that. And so it's going to be declining sort of ad infinitum, and the number of susceptibles is going gonna, is gonna to come to this low level. This level is low enough. The level of susceptibles here is low enough that this is going to be, that incidence is going to be less than recovery, that this is going to be less than that. So it's staying at a low enough level that the fire can't start taking off again. Now, so this, this year, you, you reach this tipping point where the number of infectives has plateaued, and it's all downhill from there. After this tipping point, the rate of, where the rate of infections equals the rate of recoveries, you're going to have a declining number of infectives and susceptibles, lower and lower rates of infection, and you're going to have, um, you know, change in I is dominated by recoveries. Just all these effectives are going to be recovering, and, you know, it's, it's going to zero. Remember, this is just like that stock we built earlier. Remember we built a stock just like this, and it was going to zero? Remember that? Remember that stock we built of people recovering from a serious illness? It went to zero, right? It drained to zero. Remember, we could make it longer time to drain or shorter. That's what's happening here. This is there's this stock, and it's being drained to zero by this this flow here. There's just not enough people coming in here, um, and it's going to zero. And the more it goes down, the fewer and fewer people come in here. Fewer and fewer people come in here. The more it's draining out in the meantime, it's it's just going to extinction. Now. We don't have time to go into it, but how is this different when people are coming into the population? What's going to happen here? So is this just going to go, the number of susceptibles is just going to go sort of low like this and stay low? Actually, what will happen is, look, this, this is not going to stay low because at this point, basically no one is getting affected. I mean, it's essentially so so minimal, no one is getting infected anymore down, down towards this side of things. So if there's people coming into the population through births, people coming in through um, immigration, what's going to happen is the number of susceptibles is going to build up. It's going to build up. And it's going to build up to the point where the, the, the number of infectives can start to take off again. Now that won't occur instantly, because at first they'll be really inefficient at spreading it, but the number of susceptibles will be building up, building up, at, even after that, because very few people are going out to get infected, so this will be building up, building up, even while it's sort of inefficient to infect people until it becomes fairly efficient, and then you're going to have a sort of second outbreak of this sort just down here, down the road. It's going to be a very similar thing, but probably a small... Uh, smaller magnitude down here where it will go up and come down again. And then later it will go up and come down. Go up. So you get these oscillations. But the oscillations go on. They become smaller and smaller. And they approach an endemic equilibrium. And at that endemic equilibrium, it's important, the number of people infected by each infective is, is one. So it's not going to, if it were more than one, the infection would be growing in the population. If it were less than one, it would be dying out. So it's right in that balance. And moreover, at that endemic equilibrium, this inflow equals that outflow, this inflow equals that outflow. And it's right, the whole system is in a kind of balance. The number of recoveries equals the incidence, and the number of the, the incoming people equals the incidence. So you don't get a lot of change. 
So stocks and flows are very, very, and feedbacks are very useful for understanding this. We have this kind of shift of feedback dominance. Early on, we have this positive feedback associated with infection spread. Here we have a limiting feedback associated with sort of limiting out of the infection due to limited number of susceptibles. And then we have a recovery feedback associated with recovery that's driving this decrease to zero. Um, so uh, that's all we have time to talk about here. You might want to look at some other graphs here. Um, this is like a graph of with uh, when you have people coming into the population. Here you actually have the number of susceptibles coming down. It builds up because there's not enough new infections. Builds up to the point where it becomes efficient and beyond. Or to, to spread, you have the secondary epidemic. It comes down again and then it oscillates. And here's the point where it's, it's in this kind of balance where, where the n average number of people infected uh, by each person is, is, uh, is one. The interesting thing is it's at that point, if you look, if you trace back, it's at this point, and this point, and this point, and this point. That's, it's at those points here where this thing makes the turn. So it's at that point this starts going up again. It's at this point here that this, this actually will start rising if you look into it. So this is sort of the critical point, and it, it revolves around that balance. A slight perturbation will lead to a little mini outbreak that will bring it back into the in equilibrium. Okay, so um, that's all we have uh, time to discuss here with, um, with uh, infectious disease models. Suffice it to say, there's all sorts of interesting things you could do. And you can experiment very easily with uh, representing vaccination. How would you add a vaccination stock to represent vaccination? Here's your susceptible infected recover. Here you have a vaccinated stock and you could have vaccination go out to it. You could have waning vaccination going back this way with a mean time to vaccination waning that would come back this way. And the vaccinated stock basically removes susceptibles and therefore lowers the amount of fuel available for the fire and that can keep the infection from taking off and it can keep it to the point the number of susceptibles, the fraction of susceptibles in the population low enough that each infective infects fewer than one replacement over the course of their illness. So it, it's designed to make their spread of illness very inefficient, to surround them with people who can't be infected. Enough of those people, high enough density of those people who can't be infected around them as a kind of buffer around them that, that they won't be able to, you know, on average, the infected infection will just die out in the population. And it's that goal with which we try to vaccinate people. And you can experiment in these models where you have infection taking off and at some point you have a large enough fraction vaccinated where you bring in someone, someone flies into the Saskatoon airport with an infection and it will just die out in the population on average. Maybe they'll affect one or two people, but it, it, it can't get a foothold. There's not enough fuel around for it to, to take off. And that's, that's why vaccination works out. And there's a very nice theory of, of, uh, of mathematical diseases that explain this. Um, the key here is the fraction susceptible. That's the center point of it because it relates to the efficiency of infection spread keep the fraction susceptible low enough around an individual, the infection won't be able to establish itself. It's like keeping a minimum amount of, of wood lying around so the, the fire can't take off. Um, okay, uh, anyway, that's all we have time for. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your um, participation in these. I've got a list of things that I'm gonna be improving. Um, and uh, changing the balance of materials, cutting a bunch of slides. This lets me sort of plan my, my, my time very helpfully. I do plan to have a second round of these things with different people that I'm planning to have as sort of the main, the main people there. But if any of you would like to come, you'd be most welcome to, um, to, to uh, um, sit, sit through a more refined version of this. Okay? Thank you very much. Ah, okay. I, I
push for the. Ah, okay. That's that's good. Yeah.